Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre, and we're once again recording at Nutmeg with our engineer Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is an actor, producer, archivist, historian, makeup and special effects technician, and a collector and caretaker of some of the most iconic. Iconic movie props, costumes, and paraphernalia of the last century. A collection that includes the wolf's cane handle from the original Wolfman, an original replica of the creature suit from the Creature of the Black Lagoon, and pieces from the Mummy's Curse, the only existing work of legendary makeup artist Jack Pierce. As a performer, he's been in films such as Invasion of the Sorcerer Raft of the Sun Demon, and Ratfink Abubu, and TV shows like My Three Sons, The Lucy Show, and of course, opposite our pal Larry Storch in the original Ghostbusters. (laughs) In the memorable role of Tracy the Gorilla, As a makeup and effect artist, he's worked on projects such as Not of This Earth, It, The Terror from Beyond Space, Harry and the Hendersons, and three Lord of the Ring pictures, among others. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Over his eight-decade journey through the world of fantasy films, he's met and befriended and worked with Everyone from Boris Karloff to Elsa Lanchester to George Pal to Ray Harryhausen to former podcast guests Roger Corman, Joe Dante, and Leonard Moulton. Please welcome to the show the ultimate horror and science fiction movie fan and a man who was once put in a bear hug by my favorite actor, Lon Chaney Jr., Bob Burns. Howdy, sir. <laughs> you know what? I, 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 got, I got to meet this guy. Who the heck is he? Yeah. <laughs> now, now, before we get on to any questions, what were you saying about yeah. me before we got on the air? <laughs> Not that he's fishing. I just said, yeah. Well, all right. Cover your ears now. So you, oh, you okay. got earphones on. Gotcha. That's okay. Well, anyway, I, uh, I, I've never been nervous doing these things. I've done a, quite a few and stuff. But I'm nervous today because you're an icon to me, and I don't even know how to really talk to you. That's the thing, because I've known all about you since I was a little baby. <laughs> <laughs> that is a backhanded compliment if ever yes. I heard one. <laughs> and uh, I, I just, uh, I'm kind of dumbfounded here just thinking that I'm actually talking to you. Oh, well, thank you. That's so sweet. And now I want to start off with the story of when you Mm -hmm. went to the Magic Castle in Los Angeles and and there was a big event there. And tell us Mm -hmm. the people. Well, it was going to be a thing for, I think it was Look Magazine or something. It never actually happened, but I mean, the people were there, you know. Uh, But it was uh, Boris Karloff. Uh, Lon Chaney Jr., who was my favorite, as yours, oh, mm-hmm. and Elsa Lanchester. And it was it was really something. We were sitting around a table waiting for this photographer to show up, who ended up never showing up, you know, which was great for me because I got to sit there and talk to these guys. And they were really, they were wonderful. They were all just wonderful, wonderful guys. And uh, I, I was here again, and just like with you, I was almost afraid of these guys because they were such icons of mine. I didn't really know it. But they got me in a conversation real easy. I had no problem at all. And Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, did one of the finest things that's ever happened to me in my whole life. We were talking about films he had done, and uh, like Lenny and The Wolfman, all this stuff. And I said, well, you know, there's one that I saw that's one of my very favorites, and that's called The Golden Junk Man. I think it was on the Bell Telephone Hour or something. He plays an Irish immigrant, and he's got two sons. Yeah, a great. Oh, it's wonderful. He did a wonderful accent. I mean, he was he's a good actor. I mean, he was a really good actor. And I just said, that's actually one of my favorites. And he looked at me really deeply for a minute. And I thought, maybe I said something wrong, you know. And I saw a tear go down his face. And he goes, do you remember that? And I said, well, yes, I do. That's one of my favorite things. He got up, came over, and this man built like a mountain, 
He gave me the biggest bear hug I think I've ever had in my life. He said, this is, this is my family's favorite, too, and my favorite. And he went back over and sat and, and just almost cried like a baby for a few minutes. I didn't know what to do. I thought, geez, is the moon up? We're going to get – I don't know what's going to happen to him. <laughs> it, was some, it was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. I mean, here, an idol, a guy that I loved, I got a hug from this guy. And it was just what I, you know, so that I've been that way ever since now. Yeah, I remember, I saw the golden junk man <laughs> and it, it was funny in that you, I wouldn't be surprised if the guys who wrote the Rodney Dangerfield film back to school saw mm-hmm. that because it had to do with, he's like a junk man who his kids are embarrassed about. They go to college on his money, of course, and then he yeah. wants to prove something to them. And he go, right. he was terrific in that. Oh God, he was he was marvelous in that film. And and I, and that of all of his films, I think that's one of the best things he ever did. I mean, that, because that was just him. He had no moon to worry about or anything <laughs> like that. You know? And he he was he was wonderful. And evidently, I touched his heart with that. And I'm so glad I did. That was the most wonderful thing that's happened to me. You know. And now the whole point of this event was mm-hmm. to get pictures of Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney Jr., and the bride right. of Frankenstein herself, right. uh, Elsa That's Lanchester. Right. Yep. And yep. The, fo- the the fucking photographer never showed Didn't up. Show. Never showed. No, and <laughs> oh, I, I weird. brought my gorilla. I had my gorilla suit too. I was supposed to wear the gorilla suit with these guys, which is a picture thing. I would have loved to have, had, you know. <laughs> But they, they, the guy never showed up. And so finally, at the end of the day, we said, well, we'll see you all later. And that was about it, you know. But they were wonderful to talk to. Boris was kind of quiet. He wasn't feeling too good that day. But he was still okay. But also chatted like, oh, she just chatted all over the place. She was so cool. And so did Lon. They were both, they were, they were wonderful people. I, I got to really know them that day. And did you and watch was Lon and Boris talk to each other? Not too much. They, uh, like I said, Boris was kind of quiet. He didn't say a whole lot to almost anybody. He was just he, he wasn't asleep, but I mean, he looked like he wasn't well. That's all there was to it. He came in in a wheelchair, so I don't know what that meant exactly, you know. But they were all just as nice as anybody could be to me. I mean, here a, a kid. Well, I wasn't a kid then. I was a grown up then. I, well, I've been a grown up since. Oh my God, I'm older than dirt now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's kind of what happened to me. But uh, I, I just, it, this was just such a marvelous time. And I'm glad the guy didn't show up. I, I'm sorry I didn't get pictures with him. But uh, just to have him there and talk to him and they find out what decent human beings they are, you know, it was just pretty amazing to me. A, a pinch me moment for a kid from Oklahoma. You better believe to, it. To be standing there with Frankenstein and the Wolfman and the Bride of Frankenstein. Couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was like, you know, I've said so many times, even in one of the books, I said, I, I'm, I, I'm at the right place at the right time somehow. I don't know how it's been that way for me, but it's been that way for years and years. Like Glenn Strange became like my adopted dad. I mean, he was, he, I went everywhere with that guy. And He'd just go all over. Drop, now, know. we should tell the audience, Glenn Strange yep. was the mm-hmm. last of the great Frankenstein monsters. Yep. In, that's House right. of Frankenstein, yeah. House of Dracula, and of course, Abbott yeah. and Costello meet Frankenstein. Which is one of the greatest films of all time, I think, you know, too. But, but you now, Glenn was just, no he argument. was just a great guy. Yeah, and he ended up, of course, being Sam the bartender in Gunsmoke for the rest of his sure. life, which was pretty cool. I used to go over once a week on my vacation and spend it over there with him. And we'd all talk about stuff and it just, you know, and I knew most of these other guys. I got to know well, Festus pretty well, the whole thing, you know. And one thing that was really neat, Jim didn't come down too much of the time. But most time, he'd come on set and meet everybody. But he came on one day and we're sitting outside of the uh, the saloon. Jim Arnett, you Long mean. Branch, and we had, we had chairs out there. And there were three of us are sitting here, Jim and, and Glenn and myself. And all of a sudden, Jim looked at, at Glenn and he says, you know what? I just thought of something. He says, we're just two old monsters sitting here. And Glenn says, huh? He goes, yeah. He said, a monster, a doctor tried to save me from outer space, and a doctor created you. And Glenn says, I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> James Arnaz was the to be thing. thing, right? Yeah. 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 But Very sitting good. there watching and, and, and seeing these guys and hearing this for a fan guy like me, you don't get any better than that. I mean, yeah, that was just and, that was so cool. And I think you talked about it that when – Glenn Strange was getting, when his health was really going and he was getting weak, they let him stay on as the bartender and sometimes would prop him up behind the bar. Yep. Well, Jim Arness, I can't say 
too many good things about that guy. He kept the show going when he kind of wanted to stop for a while, but everybody else wanted to keep it going. Well, when Glenn got – he had cancer and got real sick, uh, they they built like a, a – I guess it's like a, a baby chair or whatever you call it. It's pretty high up. And have him sit down in it, and all he would do is be washing glasses. He couldn't do lines anymore. But he always was in the background, so he'd get his medical insurance and everything. That was, that was Jim. That's and nice. And then when he, when he passed away, uh, Jim and I were both honorary pallbearers. And uh, I, I was okay till I saw Glenn, and that did it for me, and I almost fell apart. And Jim was right by me, and he stayed with me the whole rest of the time. Yeah, he was so great. He said, look, as long as we keep him in our minds, he's alive. He always is, and think about it. And he walked with me to the grave place and everything. I mean, I, I could never repay that guy for what he did for me. I mean, that was he's a wonderful, wonderful man. That's funny because, you know, when you see him on, on the TV show, he looks mm-hmm. like this cold, mean, angry guy. Jim Arness? Yeah. Brother of Peter Graves. Yeah. Oh, yes. 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 That's right. Yes. Right. No, that was just his thing. You know, I mean, he, he really I mean, he would do things to mess up takes just so they could out have a good outtakes. That's how funny he really was. And I'd love to be able to know whatever happened to those now, you know. And you told a story, too, that had to do with Glenn Strange in that when Lon Chaney Jr. died, and I'm sure he he burnt a lot of bridges in his life. He, he was, did. you know, he was, yeah. he was a mean drunk. By everything oh, he was I heard. very yeah. much so. Yeah, and so when when the news was looking for people to talk about him, nobody wanted to, no. and and then you helped out. Well, uh, Glenn was down with cancer then. He was in bed most of the time, and I went over to see him, and, and somehow we got talking about because Lon had just passed away, and. Uh, I said, we're trying to find somebody at CBS. I worked at CBS and trying to find somebody that can talk about him. And he says, nobody's going to talk for long. I said, no, they, they're just not. Nobody's interested. And he says, I'll talk for him. You know, and his wife said, Glenn, you, you can't go anywhere. I mean, he says, I'll talk for him. I'll do it. You know, so I called the gal down at the news thing and uh, they didn't know he was that sick. They thought he, he the cover was he had a bad case of the flu. So he had to sit down somewhere inside where he couldn't, you know, he had, couldn't be outside standing in the sun. So he did. He got out of bed and he went down there and he said some of the nicest things I've heard anybody say about anybody. I mean, he and Lon always got along. They never had a battle of any kind. And it was just, I mean, the sweetest thing I ever heard. I mean, this guy, he's trying to breathe and everything and he's, and he's just telling these wonderful things about Lon. And I, well, I started to get kind of choked up now to think about it. It, it was it was really wonderful. And uh, then when they found out later that Glenn had the cancer, uh, Ruth Ashton, who was the gal that did it, she said, God, I wish you'd have told us. It would have been so easy on He said he wanted to come down. That was it. He was his friend. Well, and he wanted to come down and, and say something good about him. You a, know? a man of character. And you bet. And then he died. He died like two weeks later or something. Yep. Yep, pretty close. I mean, he was really close to going, you know, but he he didn't seem like it when he was on the screen. I mean, he looked like he was, you know, just really good, and he just it, it was wonderful. I mean, because Glenn was probably the most honest, nice man I've ever known in my life. I mean, he nobody disliked Glenn. Everybody loved the guy, and he was just one of these fellows that you know. Wow, uh, I'm I'm so glad at least I have those memories anyway. You know, how tall was six six? And they Main, called him Pee Wee. Size is yes. <laughs> They call him Pee Wee, yeah. When he first started in the, in the 30s, he was one of the biggest guys around then in the 30s, you know, and they called him Pee Wee, and that figured, you know. He had a long career, too. I mean, people think of him as Frankenstein, and they think of him oh. as from Gunsmoke, but, I mean, he's in yeah. Flash Gordon serials. I mean, he oh, was, he's, he's in so been many things. Many, many Westerns. Yeah, he, he made over almost 500 movies altogether. Wow. Now, that's a lot of movies. That's a run. A lot of them were Westerns. Most of them were Westerns and stuff, you know, but he was just... Oh, he was the greatest guy. He said they'd be shooting two of them at one time. One time he would wear a black hat, and the next time he wears a brown hat, you know, in the other picture or whatever. <laughs> and uh, uh, Roy Barkoff was a, a nice friend of mine, too. He used to be one of the bad guys at, at uh, Republic all the time. And he and Glenn were real good friends, and they were making some Western together. And there was a thing how they used to, in a posse chase or something to get the guys really to go. Whoever got to the end first got a bottle of Jim Beam. <laughs> so they would ride like hell to get there. You know, they'd all go like crazy. You were instrumental in in, in hooking up, uh, uh, bringing uh, Karloff and Glenn Strange together. 
Yep. Uh, uh, Boris was doing a thing over at, at CBS, uh, same, same lot, uh, on Wild Wild West. And Glenn, of course, was doing Gunsmoke. Well, this friend of mine who was writing the article said, you know Glenn, don't you? I said, yeah. He says, okay. He says, do you think we could hook him up? They haven't seen each other in, God, how many years, you know? And so they did. And they did this great little article on him. And I got this great picture of both of them, which is so neat. Uh, They hadn't seen each other in years and years and years. And it was like old friends meeting again, which was so great, you know, and I I just loved it. But I just, well, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time again. That's that's my, that's my whole thing. And is it true that when uh, Glenn Strange mm-hmm. took over the part of the monster, yep. that Boris Karloff would stay late. Oh, you found that yep. in the notes, yeah. huh? Yes. That good, yeah, good <laughs> job. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah, he well, helped him. Wait, when did he learn to read? <laughs> About an hour and a half ago. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's good. That's good. He, he, no, he yeah, went he... from being intimidated by you to insulting you in the span of about 11 minutes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, well, see, I'm not nervous anymore. I'm getting better. You're getting no, the hang of this, Bob. So he, I, I he, would, yeah. he would train him yeah. to yeah. walk like the well, monster and... Right. And and he had a bad back at that point, Karloff did too, and he didn't want to do the monster anymore. And so, But he would stay with him and, and tutor him at night of showing him how to make the moves and all that stuff. And the way Glenn got the part was Jack Pierce, which was really something, the guy that created the monster, of course, which yeah, is cool. Yeah, Jack Pierce it, created yep. the Frankenstein monster, the Wolfman, yep. the mummy. All of the great He's come up on yep. this show. Yeah, every, every great ones that were ever done – you know, at Universal, jacked in him, and that was it. Well, he kept, Glenn said he kept looking at him. He did a pirate picture and had some scars on him or something. Glenn said he kept looking at him every once in a while, and he got a little worried about the guy after a while, you know. And uh, so anyway, he came in one night, and he says, if you'll stick around, it's worth $25 for me, if you, and I might get you a part in a movie. And Glenn says, God, 25 bucks? You bet I'll stay. You know, he stayed around. First thing Jack did, he's put butcher paper all over the mirrors so Glenn couldn't see anything at all. And he said, he did a lot of work with something around my head. I don't know what it was, but I couldn't see it. I didn't know. He said he worked for about an hour. And then he called, I think it was Paul Malvern, one of the guys who was producing the Frankenstein thing. He says, come on over. I've got something to show you. He comes over, and he walks in, and he looks. He says, here's your new Frankenstein monster. Now, Glenn didn't know. He's going like, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then, wow. then he pulled the paper down, and he, Glenn looked and says, my God, I look just like Boris Karloff. It was so great. But that's how he got the film. Because Jack liked his craggy face in the very first place. He thought it was neat. And he liked his height because he was so big. And he just said, this is the guy I think could do this, could take this over. And that's why he got the role. Wow. And he gave you some uh, some treasured uh, possessions, didn't he? And he sure. I have two what? things I have of, of, uh, from the Frankenstein thing, actually. From Abbott and Costello make Frankenstein, I have one of his headpieces. How about that, Gil? That he gave me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Rubber headpiece. He's, he's jealous, Bob. Yes. I know. Well, <laughs> he's got to come out. You've got to come out this area and see this stuff before I forget what it is. When There's you're in L.A., chance, you have I'm to do the tour of Bob's yes. house. Yeah. Now, yeah. You should because, you know. Yes. I heard when Boris Karloff did the monster, those boots were really heavy that he wore. And yep. They were willing to give him lighter ones, but he he wanted to stick with the heavy ones. That's what he wanted. Well, he wanted to create the character with them, you know. They, yeah, what they were, they were guys, boots that uh, laid asphalt. So they wouldn't get through the asphalt, wouldn't get through them, and they'd stomp the asphalt down. That's why they were so heavy, and it had to be, you know. But yeah, he wanted, you know, here again, he was trying to create a character, and, and he did. Because that walk was really, that's how the walk of the monster came about. So that was... Uh, it was asphalt workers' boots that mm-hmm. are the famous Frankenstein boots. Right. Yeah. Now, the ones Glenn – oh, Glenn also gave me a pair of his boots from Madden Chesson at Frankenstein. And he, 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 that's the ones he used to use when he went on tour right after the film opened up. He wore those on tour. And now they were light because they had a pair of his shoes inside of there so Glenn wouldn't slip out of them. And they were made mainly out of cork, so they weren't very, very heavy at all. They were pretty light, you know. But he had him sitting in his garage one day. I saw him sitting up there. And I said, what's that? And he goes, well, it's my boots from having Costco Meek Frankenstein. Oh, God. And then we went in the house, and he says, he brings his paper sack out of his closet. Maybe that's the way to keep rubber stuff. He was in a paper sack. I opened it up. There's the headpiece right in there. One that wasn't used, but it's there. I still have it today. It's lasted all these years. How cool was that, Gil? Oh. All right, prepare to be jealous again, Gilbert. Oh, jeez. Did you see, you got to see Bella Lugosi. <laughs> And Glenn Strange mm-hmm. live on stage. 
one of the greatest things here again. I was at the right place, the right time. It was the Orkham <laughs> Theater down in L.A. <laughs> and I heard that they were, they were going to be there for this thing. You know, they were showing Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. So I went there. And, of course, the, the, that thing is after the movie. You know, they were only on about maybe 20, 30 minutes, but it was really neat. They, they, Bela first came out in his Dracula outfit, and he looked at the back of the, the, the audience thing, way in the back of the theater, and he says, come, come. Glenn started walking down the hallway to him, going to the thing, and it, it was kind of a, it was a slant down. He's got to be kind of careful. And he, uh, Jack Kevan, who did the makeup on him from Abbott Testimony, Franklin, he made this wonderful mask of Glenn that looked just like him. I mean, you couldn't tell when he had it on, so he wouldn't have to really put the makeup on, you know. So he had that, and he walked all the way down, goes up to the stage, meets Bella, and they kind of do a little something or another. I can't remember what it is. And, oh, I know what they're going to do. They were going to cut some person's head off from the audience. It was a plant. They got this gal up there and everything, and Glenn puts her down and throws the the, the slab down. It's going to hold her neck, and then they chop it off. And they thought in the audience, of course, it's a head of cabbage inside the thing, you know. But it was pretty cool. It was really, they were only on for maybe 20, 30 minutes, but it was great to see both of these guys. Here they were, I mean, the original monsters walking around on the stage. You know, it was really cool. So you you got in person to see yeah. Boris Karloff, Lon yeah. Chaney Jr., Bela Lugosi, yep. and Glenn yep. Strange. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Jack Pierce, he knew he knew Jack Pierce oh, too. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I knew I knew Jack. Yeah, and it was uh, well, Jack. The reason I got to know Pierce and Pierce like liked me so much, he was kind of a curmudgeon. He was kind of hard to get along with, but he loved Glenn. He absolutely loved him. And when I said Glenn was like my second dad, it, everything went away. He said, "Oh my God, okay, fine, I'll talk to." you. That's why he gave me one of the only piece of Jack Pierce's work because Rick Baker's checked in on this and everything of the Mummy's Curse mask that Cheney wore. In wow. the end of Mummy's Curse, and I still have it, and it's still in pretty. It's in better condition than I am. I'll tell you that, you know. But it's great, and, uh, and so I've just been so lucky. And you bring up his name, the the great mm-hmm. makeup artist uh, Rick yeah. Baker from yeah. uh, Ed, who did Eddie Murphy and all the other clumps. Uh. In oh, the sure. Nutty Professor. American Bear, Werewolf in London. Yeah, the list goes on. Yep. Brilliant makeup artist. Yep. And you knew him when he was a little sniveling kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I met him when he was 13 years old. He, uh, I used to work over at Don Post Studios, which was a mask maker in the day. Oh, yeah. And I'd work over there and, and help him at night doing stuff. Don Sr. was the nicest guy in the planet. I don't think I ever paid for one of his masks. I mean, he gave me all of them. And so uh, I, I just... I, I love these guys, and I love this stuff so much, you know. And so one day, I, I autographed, a, I had made my gorilla suit and had a picture of him there in the Mad Mummy or, I don't know, some kind of crazy thing. And uh, so Rick, I guess his father brought him over to post one day, and he saw this picture. He said, oh, boy, I, he goes, his dad, I'd like to meet Bob Burns. I'd like to meet who he is. Of course, when he met me, he was totally disappointed, of course. I mean, that, that goes without saying. <laughs> You know, but he, he thought in reading stuff, he thought, hey, he's a good guy, you know, whatever. But anyway, so he had his dad call me. He was too embarrassed and said, my boy would like to meet you. And I said, fine, great. He came up and he had some little things he had made up, little rubber pieces, stuff he had been doing. And they were great looking stuff for a 13-year-old kid. So I showed him how to do a, a cut on my arm. And uh, it was it was kind of cool because that's what I used to have to do in the Army. I used to do, do fake makeups for Army films and stuff like that, you know. And it was great as something it wasn't real. I had to look a book of real ones, and I heaved for three or four days. I mean, so it wasn't that. I could do the fake stuff. It's fine. And uh, so anyway, he came back. I guess it was the next week, I think. And he had done one himself, this 13-year-old kid. that was 10 times better than the one I did. I mean, already. And I thought, oh, my God, there's no stopping this guy, man. He's going to keep going. And then years later, when he was about... 19 or something like that, I took him over to the makeup place, uh, the makeup union, and tried to see if we could get him in as a uh, apprentice thing. And the guy headed the union is so typical, like they were, because it used to be a closed shop. If you weren't a relative, you didn't get in, you know. And so he looked at Rick's stuff and he said, you know, it's pretty good looking stuff, kid. It's not bad. You know, come back to us in about five, six years. See what, you know. And I got mad. I got really mad and almost got kicked out of the place because I started spurting off stuff. And Rick said, no, no, that's fine. That's okay, kid. Now, what Rick did, he just got even. Because he finally got doing stuff in makeup 
for films that weren't union. And, he, and the union guys were going, oh, man, we've got to get this guy in the union. They finally begged him to join the wow. union. He didn't have to take the tests or anything. you know. So And now, of course, he's about the best makeup guy in the whole world. He just retired finally, unless he finds something he really wants to do again. you know. And uh, we've been friends ever since then. You know, and I can't believe, like, he's in his 60s now. So what does that make me? About 110, <laughs> I'm sure. And you, used, you, know, you did a bunch of those stage shows. Oh, the spook shows. Yeah, where they'd oh, be yeah. showing a monster movie, and yeah. then there'd be this yeah. extra live show. Yeah, yeah, that was, those are kind of fun. They were kind of dangerous, too, but they were fun. Uh, I did my gorilla in a lot of those. I, I would, uh, they'd be showing something, and then they'd, they'd blank out the screen or something, have a blackout for a couple of minutes, and I would come down in the gorilla suit, and by the time lights went back on, I'm right down where the people are, and they're scattering all over the place because I'm... <laughs> All over the place, snorting, snorting, all that kind of stuff, you know. And that was fun, but it was kind of dangerous because people would try to kill you sometimes. <laughs> you know, that, that, so that wasn't so much Didn't fun. Did you get attacked when and, you were dressed as a mummy? Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess they wanted some tanner leaves. I don't know what it was. <laughs> just, uh, what, a bunch of kids uh, just jumped on you in the dark? No, these were adult guys, man. Adult they were kids. Was like <laughs> oh my gangs God. and stuff. And well, I... this, this one theater I did one at, this guy, it was a bad place in town. So he was smart. He hired the worst guys to take care of me. You know, he said, well, if they take care of him, they won't kill him. They'll be taken care of him. We're going to pay him. So here I come out in the mummy thing, and the idea was I get about oh two, two deals up in the audience, and then a blackout comes, and they get me out of there, and I'm gone. You know, well, what happened that day was a thunderstorm. It hit, hit when the lights were going, they didn't come back on. Knock the track electricity out. I'm walking. I walk another two or three aisles. I'm going, oh, oh, I don't like this. And I hear somebody go, let's get the mummy. And I thought, oh, <laughs> oh man. Oh, jeez. Wow. Well, the first thing I did was I loaded up my mummy suit, of course, with all kinds of bad things. And uh, all of a sudden, I feel these hands on me. And I'm thinking, it's it. Goodbye. Kathy saw something going on. She thought I was dead. That was it. And this one of the guys says, man, we're paid to take care of you. Don't worry about it. And they took me off to the back. It was a riot in the theater by the time they got the lights back on. Theater seats were torn out. Those things were bolted down, were torn out. Uh, they went out to the concession stand, broke all the candy things, and got, oh, it was a mess. By the time I got out of the mummy suit and got back around the block, there were four or five cop cars, and they were in there just beating heads with these things. I never saw anything like it. it Unbelievable. An situation. And yeah, I, but, I heard that, I, I read in one of your books that uh, there was, you were a gorilla for one of the mm -hmm. live shows and yep. some kid had either a can or a bottle of a liquid yes okay yes. that was a deal we did i did with uh eddie munster uh butchie butchie you know in in uh, i think it was uh, arizona somewhere it was a shopping mall opened up and they wanted to see how we we're going to work together i was going to be his new pet in the show oh yeah. you were going to be on the monsters yeah. for a while and, and yeah, he, was. he was on the podcast too we had him here yeah yeah did, yeah and yeah. he's such a good kid good oh, guy butch. Great guys so so anyway we uh we went there and it worked just fine. I mean we worked we were up on a pedestal thing and all that stuff and did our thing and he's I'm on a chain and he's taking care of me. I just wanted to see how we worked together. We worked just perfect together. It was great. And all of a sudden I see some cops way in the back and there's but some big something's going on. I have no idea what it is. So we get through, we go off and this guy walks up one of the people that own the mall and says, "Do you want do you want to press charges?" And I said, for what? He said, this kid, we just got, this kid was like 12 years old. He wasn't a little kid. He said, he's got a, a bottle full of lye. And he's trying to squirt it in your eyes, trying to get close enough to squirt it in your eyes. And uh, he said, what would you have done? I said, well, go blind, probably. It's the first thing I'd do. And then I'd have all kinds of dirty language coming out, for sure. And uh, I, I said, well, I don't want to press charge because I didn't see him do it. But they did. They pressed charges against him anyway. So it's dangerous doing that. One time I was at Magic Mountain. <laughs> Crazy. But, wow. Well, my gorilla, I did gr the gorilla out at Magic Mountain for a while. So, it was the thing. We would go around a little cart deal, you know, and, and entertain the people in line. And we did one night show, which I didn't really want to do, but we had guards around. They found this one guy with a, almost an eight-inch eight shiv. He was going to poke right in the back of my, in my kidneys in the back. Wow. And they got him before he did it. Yeah. So playing a gorilla is not, well, any kind of monster is not real fun. But wasn't, didn't Glenn Strange punch a kid out? Oh, the out? kid ran out yeah. and kicked him in the leg. <laughs> That's that a crazy story. 
<laughs> I didn't see that show, but that was wonderful. Yeah, it was back east somewhere. And Glenn had a bad knee from a, a big wreck he was in in a stagecoach years ago in the movie. So he was kind of a bum knee, you know. And he was walking down the aisle like he did before. And this kid there, and he kicked him in that knee. He was some bad kid, you know, some rat. He, he kicked him. And Glenn said it hurt so much that he just threw his hand out. I mean, he had a big ham hock hand, I'll tell you. And he hit this kid right in the face. And after the show ended, they went and they found the guy laying over in the chair, his jaw <laughs> broken, just hanging there. Broke his jaw. Wow. Just with a reflex. Jaw. And the other kid said he had it coming. We told him not to do that. He did it. He had it coming. He said the man was totally okay in doing that, you know. But, yeah, he's, he's punched a few people like that. <laughs> So, when you're in a monster so, thing, people try to kill you. You could have been blind or dead now from those yes. shows you did. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. It's just uh, my wife said I'm too honorary to die. <laughs> so I, Your I wife, Kathy, who's thing. sitting right there where we, we should tell our listeners, yeah, we're, we're sitting, looking at yeah, Bob on is, a screen. Yes, she, he's in the now, you know. But well, one time I did a, an opening of a, a Hollywood uh, wax museum. Thing they had, and I was there, and I was I was in the foyer with this little little dwarf guy. It was in a bobby suit from England, you know, little cop thing, and he's walking around. And, I'm, and I was one of the few uh, gorillas, by the way, that could ride a skateboard. So I was on the skateboard <laughs> riding around in there, and uh, all of a sudden. Kathy saw this guy. I couldn't see him because he's behind me. A guy came up. He was drunk, and he tried to light my suit on fire. Now, if he had let that, if it got on fire, it would burn like kindling. I mean, really fast. She saw it, and she kicked it out of his hands. It landed in the street, and it was like a Laurel and Hardy thing. All of a sudden, this big truck came and just mashed it to smithereens. There wasn't anything left of it. And the guy's going, hey, man, my lighter. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, you got to watch that stuff. But she always watched me. And you can honestly say you starred in Ghostbusters. <laughs> Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I guess but so. That when you did yeah. it, it wasn't quite the money that the later goes. Uh, no, I'm, I'm afraid not. No, I. Uh, oh, Tucker used to get mad at me about that too, because Forrest Tucker was the other guy in there, and he just would say, you know, he said, "How much are you getting for this?" I said, "I'm getting scale." And he says, "What are you getting for the gorilla suit?" And I said, "Nothing." He goes, "Oh my God!" So if we go for another season, I, I'm going to negotiate for you. And it's funny, he became like the father figure on the show for me. He really did. That's he nice. Just, he took he took care of me. Like I, I was supposed to get breaks and get the head off, but we were, we were late in getting started, and I didn't want to do that. So I did pass out once, just too hot. He came over, first guy over to me, got the head off, and he says, aren't you supposed to get breaks? And I said, well, I should, but we're behind. I don't want to hold anything up. And he said, look, if you die, we don't have a show. You know, so, so, <laughs> let's, let's fill in some so, blanks for our listeners. Go, go ahead, Bob. Finish the story. Yeah. Well, anyway, he, uh, he said, okay, here's what, I'm going to have new rules. Here's what you're going to do. When Bob gets hot, he's going to tell you, give me a signal. When he does, uh, we're going we're gonna to stop that scene or whatever it is. And he, you put water on him, give him a fan, whatever he needs. I'm going to my trailer and have a little drink. <laughs> and uh, a, a pretty big drink, as a matter of fact. But, and he came back out. You know, he drank quite a bit, and I never saw the guy drunk, never in my life on that show. He was the most amazing guy. Well, he was like Flynn and all the rest of those old guys, you know. They had a tolerance. He knew how to handle liquor. Those old guys, those old showbiz guys, they could bottle, they could uh, down a few bottles of scotch and then go right on camera. Yeah. Exactly. Even in his F Troop character, Sergeant O'Rourke, was a drinker. Yeah. Oh, they yes. Worked, they worked it into the story. Yeah. Line. Oh, they yeah, had they did. to. Yeah. But he was, you know, but I never saw him drunk. It was so weird. The first time I saw him, uh, when we did a couple of shows, and, and I was looking at him, he was sitting in a chair and one eye's kind of half closed. And I thought, <laughs> oh, he's through for the day, man. That's <laughs> the end of that. Then they said, okay, on set and all that. I never saw a guy, he, like, turned a switch. He went on there. He never blew a line, ever. You know, and he had a photographic memory, by the way, too. So he didn't even bring the script in during the day. Wow. He was amazing. You know, but he he became the father figure to me. And now's the point in the show where uh, my co-host Frank is going to roll his eyes and go, oh, no. <laughs> you're going to sing? Yeah, no. No. That, oh, God. You'll, you'll wish. Oh, uh, you're not going to ask him that uh, question, are far, you? Yes. <laughs> Forrest oh, Tucker. Dodge yes. this one, oh. Bob. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking. He's kind of a legend in the way that Milton Berle was a legend. Bigger than Milton Berle. What? I put bigger than Milton Berle. I'll put it that way. They had a contest. He won by two inches. (laughs) He won. So so you're saying... The only time Milton Berle was beating anything, I think. (laughs) 
<laughs> Forrest Tucker's appendage oh, was bigger yes. than Milton Berle's. It was pretty big. Yeah, it was. You know, it was probably the size of a. Uh, I don't, what would you call it? a large salami? I guess is the best way to think about it. <laughs> I heard I on 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 the Country Club he belonged to a uh, Forrest Tucker yeah. as a yeah. joke. He got on his knees and he hit. The, uh, do you know the story? No, but I think I'm gonna. Okay. <laughs> That Forrest Tucker got on his knees on the golf course and yeah. whipped Keep it, it out. Cleaned. Yeah, he he whipped it out yeah. and he hit the ball. <laughs> he putted. He putted. Yeah. Yeah. It was That's a right. Putt. I've heard that he did it. I mean, I never heard from him. I heard from other people he did it. Yeah. It's a gimme, a gimme uh, putt. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it, well, he'd he'd show it to anybody to ask. I mean, he didn't care, man, woman, or child, or, wow. or what it was, that's, baboon, or anything. That's what I always heard about Burl also. But, I mean, yeah, I guess yeah. if you were blessed in that way, why would I, I guess you? so, yeah. yeah. I would never show mine to anybody. Well, well see, well, the, the problem with mine is it goes inward. Yeah. <laughs> So it doesn't do me any good anyway. I wouldn't even think of doing something yeah. like that, you know. You're a sport, but, Bob. Uh, yeah. My yeah. wife <laughs> hasn't seen mine. <laughs> <laughs> she needs a jeweler's loop. Well, my wife didn't know I had one when we got married. She was pretty disappointed for a while. You know, till I sort of unrolled it a, a little bit. Oh. You know, it came out to its, it came out to its two, full, two and a half inches. So, you know, that was good. <laughs> you got your but you can't have everything. Well, you yes. know, I... I well, I heard the gorillas have small penises too, so I, I was okay with it. <laughs> let's let's let's. I just want to go back and fill in a couple of blanks. The Ghostbusters, for our listeners that don't remember, was Bob was Tracy the gorilla opposite right. Forrest Tucker, who we now know a lot of a lot about <laughs> a lot more than when we started this, and of course our friend Larry Storch, who did this show, right? And we yes. love we love Larry, and it was uh, it was it was your gorilla suit. You built a gorilla. Which yep. is taking the story back a little bit. You turned to your wife one day yeah. and you said what? Out of the blue. I said, I, well, I always loved gorillas when I was a kid. Gorilla movies and jungle movies. That, mm-hmm. that, one day I just said to her, boy, I'd like to build a gorilla suit. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought that might have been the end of it. I wasn't sure for sure. You know, you've got this small unit and you want to build a gorilla suit? But anyway, I did. <laughs> And she said, well, I can build a suit. But what I did is I went over to Don Post Studios, who built these great masks. He built my first head, which I called Kogar. It was really a mean thing. Then when I went a more benevolent thing, and a 20-year-old Rick Baker made the Tracy head for me, whoever came the Tracy head. Wow. That's one of the first gorillas he ever did. And uh, so that that's why it worked. And everybody thought, uh, it's so funny how you can pull this stuff off sometimes, that it was it was strictly uh, like it had mechanics in it and all that kind of stuff and move the brows. It didn't. The way mine did was like Charlie Gamora, the great ape man years ago that I learned from, uh, did his. It just, just the mouth opens and closes. That's all. And your eye expressions do the rest of it. So that's what I did. I, I just would, you know, move my head around, and the body English took care of the rest of it. And people thought they saw the brows move and everything else. They didn't, really. You know. And Rick Baker is another guy uh, who's an expert uh, as far as ape uh, suits oh, go. Yeah. Right. King Kong. Yep. The best. He, he, he built the best suits ever built. I mean, as far like in Gorillas in the Mist. There were real gorillas in there, and then there his two fake gorillas in there. And I went to he had Kathy and I go and see the premiere of it. We looked at it. He said, "Now nah, tell me which gorillas were mine and which gorillas were the real ones." I got them both wrong. Wow! wow. He, his gorillas I thought were real, and the other real gorillas I thought were his suit. He's a genius no, he, in his he, way, Rick Baker. Oh, he's a total genius. The guy can do anything. I mean, he can literally do anything. And he said, if he ever finds a movie, he kind of doubts it now that he ever wants to really do. He'll rent a place and do it, you know. But he's perfectly happy the way he is. He gets to see his girls now. And it's it's great. Yeah. And when you were a little kid, uh, you found out, I think the movie was, was it a Prehistoric Planet or Prehistoric? It had to do with those guys in dinosaur suits. <laughs> Unknown Island, yes. yes. Unknown, Unknown Island. Island, that's it. I <laughs> forgot that one. Yeah. yeah. So, they, and they were guys in... In dinosaur outfits. Right. And, and Now, for a kid that's 13 years old or something, to see guys in a dinosaur suit, you can imagine. All kids love dinosaurs, you know. Sure. And I almost fainted when I saw these guys, even though they were crude as could be. They were guys that were nine feet tall in dinosaur suits. And, <laughs> and this was being shot out in the desert. Palmdale. Yeah. 
And yeah. and so yeah. they were wearing these heavy dinosaur suits. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, and, Jesus. And, and it was like 200 degrees. Yeah. Well, I, I luckily I, I knew Ellis Berman, who was the, the great makeup artist guy. He's the guy that made all the, the head pieces for, the, for Glenn. He made the Wolfman nose. He made the cane head from the and, Wolfman, and the which one I have. Pro, and Frankenstein yeah. meets the Wolfman. He did Bela Lugosi's Frankenstein head. Ellis yes, Berman. he did. He did all that. And he's great. And he was a terrific guy for doing this stuff, you know. And so I, I just, I love this stuff so much. That was just it, you know. I, I, that's when I really got into it. But I, when I saw these films and I thought, okay, and I, I got to know Ellis Good. And he said, well, we're going out to the desert pretty soon to shoot this stuff. You want to come out with us? I said, yeah. So I skipped school and everything else. And laid light and my folks said I died that day or something. I can't remember <laughs> <laughs> they didn't pay too much attention to me as long as I didn't get in trouble, you know. So anyway, I uh, I went out with them, and I was out there the whole day, and it, it was about 120. And, and these guys were just stunt guys in these things. They had never worn suits before, and they were canvas with rubber. They were heavy. And the way they worked their little hands, they just pulled little little wires down, and the hands would move. And they had, for making the mouth move, they would pull it and grab it, and they would, you know, grab the thing. And they had a thing, and they'd pull it down, and the mouth would just open and close. Now, sometimes, you even see it in the film, it didn't go back the way it's supposed to. It'd go over here, or go over here, and like that. But they used it anyway. It was great. But to see these guys, though, like four guys walking around in the desert, like these dinosaurs, what other kid in the world ever got to see that? You know, it, it, it was just wonderful. And that movie, it's one of those movies, like, you know, very tacky, very low budget. <laughs> the dinosaurs make the early Godzilla ones look like state of the art special <laughs> effects. That's true, they but, do. Yeah, but Unknown Island's a fun movie. Oh, it's very fun. And and Crash Corrigan, Ray Crash Corrigan, who did gorilla suits back in the thirties and forties, he's a sure, cowboy guy, sure. a cowboy star. Well, he uh, he played the the uh, sloth in the thing. He was the big sloth. Oh yes. That, that, Fought him and all that stuff, you know. So he was as hot as everybody else, too, you know. But it was really hot. And one thing I do, couldn't understand is once in a while I do close-ups of these things, and they'd throw this, this dirt up in front of them. And I thought, what are they trying to do, cool them off? Or what? I didn't know what it was until I saw the film. And when they, they showed the long shots with the bomb things going off around them, that's when they cut to the close-ups and you saw the stuff floating around them. So it looked like that was still the smoke and stuff coming up. And, and you saw a few of them faint in their dinosaur. Yeah. Well, that one guy, it was just, I mean— uh, there's other guys that fainted too, but they had the typical stage fall. They kind of brr, brr, bump, you know. This guy just went out and went boom. He was down. That was all there was to it. So the guys that were directing it and doing it, they had Barton McLean shoot like a uh, a grenade rifle at him, and then so then they cut into it, <laughs> and, and the, the guy really falls, and, and he's just like, I got him at time, something like that, you know. So, but they used McLean. So you wouldn't yeah. waste uh, you wouldn't the waste a guy movie. passing out from heat stroke. No, man. I mean, that, that was great stuff on Use film, it. you know, because the others, it never looked that good, you know. I've been, I've been to Palmdale. It's insanely hot. Yes. Yeah. yeah I couldn't imagine walking around in a, <laughs> in a costume. And wasn't, uh, yeah. I think they were like, had guys holding them at one point <laughs> when they. Yeah, they couldn't sit down with these tails. They couldn't do it. It took a half an hour to try to get them out of there. So they were so hot. What they did, now this is very strange. I've got a picture of this, and it's very odd. Uh, one of the prompt guys would lean over, and the dinosaur would lean on him, and it looked like some sort of weird mating ritual. It looked very strange when you saw it. You know, and uh, it was it was pretty well. That's what they would do. That's how they got a rest. That's the only way they could. You know, so it looked like a guy. To, you know, it looked like a guy but, having sex with a dinosaur. Uh, that's that, or a dinosaur having sex with a guy. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's what. It was. Yeah, he was. Oh. He was the guy that received it. You he, see, yeah, he'd be the more dominant one. The dinosaur, obviously. Yes, I think so. Yeah, dinosaur. You know, on top. I don't know what the what I don't know what the child looked like. I'd like to see it. You know. <laughs> But it was pretty funny. It was really neat. Well, that's the way they did movies in those days, you know. Well, and speaking of movie sets, you you getting to go uh, visit movie sets as a kid. Another another yeah. one, and it's a story in, in both your books, is you got to go to yeah. the set of Destination Moon and oh, meet the legendary yeah. George Pal. And yeah. that, changed, changed, my that life. changed your life. Tell us what happened. Well, I went to school with a kid that his dad was a grip on the film. And I'd always been a science fiction guy, the moon and stuff like that. And he said, hey, I'm going over after school with my dad. We're gonna, he's working on this picture about going to the moon. I had no idea what it was. I'd never heard of it. I said, okay. So I went over with him, 
And sure enough, you know, I walked in that stage and they had it refrigerated because these guys in these spacesuits were really hot. And I walked in there and I got this chill from being excited and also from being cold. And this whole moonscape was just, I never saw anything like it in my whole life. I mean, it was like, oh my God, this is something, you know. And I met George Powell and we were friends until the day he died in 1980 something. You know, he was just the nicest man ever. I mean, I, I've never met a guy like him. And name some of the movies George Powell made. Some of the great films. Oh, he did uh, Destination Moon, When Worlds Collide, yeah, War of the one. Worlds, The Time Machine, which is one of my favorites, yep, of course. Yep. And a couple of, uh, oh, I forget what he did. Uh, oh, he did Houdini, as sure. a matter of fact. He did a lot of films that, that weren't really you know, that popular, but they were wonderful films. Well, Gilbert loves The films. Seven Faces of Dr. Lau. Yes. That is, okay, that's my wife's favorite right there. That's her favorite ah, film. Ah, she's giving Ka- the okay. Kathy's <laughs> giving us the thumbs <laughs> yeah. up there. She she gave us two okay. That's a tour de force. That Tony Tony Randall performance. Many I think Tony should have got the Academy Award for that. I don't know who did, but he sure should have. That was man. He played all of those characters. Yeah, it's a magical film. And uh, oh. George Powell. It's so funny because at one point they're having a parade, and one of the creatures in the parade is one of the Morlocks from uh, Time yeah. Machine. Yeah, it's, it's well. It's a little change. It's supposed to be a, uh, a like an abominable snowman, but it looked pretty. I mean, the makeup was oh, almost yeah. the same. You know, that was one of your sons. It was in that oh, suit, wow. as a matter of fact. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, he, he did it. One of the things in the book, in yeah. both both books, that's touching, uh, mm-hmm. Bob, is your 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 relationship with both uh, Glenn Strange, yeah, uh, and George. You say if you wanted to be, if you ever wanted to be like anybody, if you ever wanted to emulate anybody, it was the two of them. Oh, absolutely. They were two of probably the best people I've ever known in my life. I mean, just of being just really honest to God, great, great folks. I mean, George, everybody loved George. I don't know one person that ever had a bad thing to say about him. And like Glenn's funeral, for crying out loud, there must have been a thousand people showed up. And these were old cowboys and wheelchairs and mm-hmm. walkers and almost everything. You know, it was, uh, it was, they were amazing people. Boy, I wish we had more people like them now, you know. Gilbert's the only one I know it's even close. <laughs> Yes. He just puts you in rarefied company, Gil. And, <laughs> and I heard one time, like, the Motion Picture Academy visited, because you have an insane collection of movie mm-hmm. memorabilia. O- over a thousand uh, items. Yeah, horror, sci-fi. And they came over there, mm-hmm. and you have, like, King Kong and everything. Yeah, he's got the original yeah. armature. And what yep. did what did they want? They wanted a uh, uh, camera kit from uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin. That's all they cared about. It was used in he, he used that when he was shooting the uh, oh something in the snow up. I can't remember Gold Rush. The or Gold something. Rush. I can't remember what it was. That's the only thing they were interested in. Period. So they and looked thought, down. Well, yeah. On yeah. horror and science fiction. They did. I obviously did, yeah. And they just thought that was the best. I mean, when I saw the Time Machine or Kong, I thought, oh, man, they're going to want that for sure, you know? No. They said, it doesn't look like King Kong anymore. <laughs> I said, well, you don't either, you know? So, I don't know. It was, it, it was not fun at all. I, I kind of, well, I didn't really kick him out, but I said, guys, I got, I, I got to go shine some shoes, so I got to go, you know? And you are, are one of those people, you know, you have, like, memorabilia from classic horror and mm-hmm. sci-fi, and from the, you know, decidedly less than classic. And and oh, you, yeah. to, to you, they're all even. Oh, yeah, they are. I mean, it's all made by artisans, by guys that, you know, people have to see these things in person, I think. I mean, because to really appreciate them and what they were, you know, they're just, they can't just be thrown away. And, of course, the movies used to throw them away until, of course, uh, eBay came along. That took care of that, you know, right away. <laughs> but I, I, I just think this stuff has to be seen. That's all there is to it, you know. So Kathy and I try to make it when we can. Of course, now my health's gone to hell, so I'm a little different now. You can see a bandage on me here. Well, that bandage, I took a bad fall the other day and almost clobbered my arm to pieces. Uh, I'm an old guy, so I fall down a lot, you know. And uh, not from drinking anymore. I quit that. <laughs> 
<laughs> and not not from heat if, while he's wearing a dinosaur yes. costume. No, no, not that either. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd climb in my gorilla suit still if I could. That's for darn sure, you know. But uh, no, I'm just getting old, and it just you just start to fall apart after that. And uh, I so don't ever get 82. Whatever you do, just if it's 81, <laughs> stop it. So, so if people if say, people come to the house though, uh, Bob, you yeah. and send yes. the legendary's Bob's basement. People, you still give tours of the stuff. I mean, there's there's some videos on YouTube. I do, of I you do and occasionally Kathy. when I can. Yeah, Kathy usually gives the tours now. I mean, mm-hmm. she knows the stuff as good as I do now, and she hasn't tripped yet like I have. So, <laughs> she's doing all right. But I, uh, yeah, we can whenever I, I feel good enough, we can open it up. Yeah, I do. I like to open it up to anybody I can. I can't take groups of people through, you know, but but I do take people through if I can. Yeah. And what is your opinion on on CGI? Well, I think CGI has a, has a real place. I mean, they're a great fixer for things, getting rid of wires, getting rid of stuff, and all, and they're really good at doing things. But I like the way that, that Peter Jackson and Guillermo uses this stuff. They try to use the big full-size stuff if they can and full-size monsters, and they use CGI where they have to to kind of bridge the gap between those, and that's what they do, and they're still doing them. Some people, the, the, the producer people, I should say, say, oh, CGI is the only way to go now. They don't realize it's, that's twice as expensive as a monster suit. But they don't realize that. They think it looks better. But but the problem I have with a lot of CGI stuff, and this is not putting anybody down, it's just the guys that do the CGI, a lot of them aren't actors. And you've got to be an actor to portray this stuff. And if you're not an actor, you're just pushing a mouse around or something. It doesn't have the same, it doesn't have really real feeling to it, to me. Some do. I mean, Kong now did. Peter's Kong. My God, that was wonderful. And this new Kong that's just out is wonderful, too. It gets, I mean, really well done. But they're never going to replace actors. They say someday we'll be able to have Humphrey Bogart walking around again. I don't think so. It's going to look pretty bad if you do. It's a good tool. I think it's a really good tool, but it's not the fix-all. Also, for a collector like yourself, there's nothing. There's nothing tactile. There's nothing to take away from the experience. Nope. You don't get the model or the armature or the or the spaceship. Nope. Yeah. Well, one friend of mine told me a while back. He says, "Now, from now on, when we give you a prop, or if we do, it's going to be on a CD-ROM. That's yeah. it. You know, and that uh, that makes me feel bad. <laughs> Some, sometimes I think CGI looks too slick. Yep. Or it takes you out. It looks it cold. Does. Yes. It takes you out of the yeah. story. It does. It really does. Yeah, it, d- it doesn't look right. Yeah. Like, I feel like with the stuff, well, like the Rick Baker stuff with appliances or back to right. the Lon Chaney Wolfman pictures. Oh, my God. You yes. know you could touch it. Yep. That's it. Which which is what Forrest Tucker said, too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> A nice segue. <laughs> Forrest, said, Forrest said, touch it anytime you want. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Just leave some money in this bowl. Oh, that's leave. hilarious. <laughs> and, Bob, you lend some of the props to the studios uh, sometimes. I mean, you'll take something and you'll give it back when they're making a sequel. Yeah, or they'll yeah. need a certain item. Yeah, well, like on, on the, the Alien series, I've loaned the queen back to them twice now. So they could redo another queen or use that queen, it's, you know, stuff like that. Now they're doing it. The latest Ridley Scott that's just out right now, I understand, is 90% CGI. With the aliens and stuff now. And I'm sure it looks quite good, too. I, I, I haven't seen it yet, but it, it, say it looks good. But, boy, I like to have the thing sitting in front of me. Well, you can touch it, and people can touch yeah. Like with Kong, I love to ha- I just I would just take Kong. He's pretty heavy, and hand it to somebody and say, here, get pictures with it. They go, oh, I can't touch that. No, no, no. I said, no, no, please. You know? The armature, uh, you mean. So if you, yes, yeah. if you can touch stuff, I, I let people do that because I think it's really important to do that. You've got to go there, Gil. You've gotta, oh, you, you, when you're in to. L.A. doing gigs, you've got to go to Bob's yeah, basement. He'll, he'll let you, you hold gotta. the King Kong. And now, it, you have it had to, rabbit yeah. fur on it, huh? The original, the Kong Yes, originally had rabbit fur. And then, uh, in fact, the Kong I have is also the son of Kong because they took that armature, stripped the rabbit fur off of it, and put white, white, gray rabbit fur on it. And right. so it's been used for both both Kongs, actually, which is pretty cool. But he still looks like Kong, even though he's stripped. He still looks great. You know? and, and you got to see Willis O'Brien at work. Wow. Oh, that How about that, that, that was a fun time. Oh, my he was, God. He was, doing, he was doing the uh, Black Scorpion, as a matter of fact. And a friend of mine knew him and knew Pete Peterson, who was the guy that worked with him toward the end. And we got to go over to his, it's a garage thing he was shooting in. And he was shooting the scene where the scorpion's coming down the train track and the train hits it, or he hits the train, I guess, or something. So he was doing this whole thing with the scorpions. And, and he was such a nice man. I mean, I know I was probably really making him pissed off, you know, because I kept, well, how do you do this? And why did, you know, and he said, <laughs> I'll tell you why, you know, but he was, he was great at it. He was, he was so nice, so nice to me. 
and uh, he had, uh, uh, I guess it might have been Pete's wife. I don't know, Pink, we was there, make like tuna sandwiches for us for a while. We had tuna sandwiches out there and stuff. And he, I found him just a great guy to talk to. I don't think anybody talked to him that much about stuff, you know. He didn't know, he, I guess he just didn't know he had too many fans, I think, or something. Like, but I, that, was, that was a great thing. Wow. I always hated, I, I mean, I loved as a kid. I knew how they do did it with the stop motion, mm-hmm. with the anim, on, animatronics. Yeah. But I always hated when I'd watch a dinosaur picture and it would be like lizards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean they really use leaves? Yeah. Yeah. I oh, felt like real iguanas so and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I hated that too. Well, you know that's sad because when they did the remake of the Lost World years ago, and they hired uh, Willis to be there, but that's just because Aaron Allen wanted to have his name. He didn't do anything at all, you know. And they used these lizards and glued the rubber scales on them and stuff. And you know, I think I think Ole, he just walked away. Willis didn't say, I, I, "I can't handle this." I, wow. can't do it. I heard when yeah. they called him. He was kind of excited, like he'd get a chance nope. to recreate, that's, like yep. you know, King Kong and the Lost World. Well, that's world. that's what that's what he was told that you you'll be able to armatures and there'll be these lizards climbing around, and then somehow during the way he got done, uh, that's too expensive to do that. We don't have the time to do it and all that stuff. But he, well, you know, he walked out on Son of Kong too. Uh, he was he was doing Son of Kong. And uh, they started making him do these silly things, like he falls down, and he crosses his eyes, and all this stuff. And and he, Willis just said, "No, no, no! You're not. It's Son of Kong. You're not going to make him be stupid and funny. It's not going to happen." So he walked out of the film, and I think it was Buzz Gibson had to finish all the animation on it because he just wouldn't do it. He was a purist with this stuff, you know. My God, he created it. Why not? You know. As long as we're talking Kong, Bob, did you audition yeah. for the for the seventies Kong remake in a Bigfoot costume? <laughs> you had to ask about that. Huh? <laughs> It's in the book. Oh, I'm sorry about that, too. That's the one thing she didn't cut out. She should have. Well, yeah, well, what it was, it's a friend of mine, uh, Chris Mueller, who was a great sculptor and did a lot of great stuff uh, over at Universal, and he did Jaws, and he did all this kind of stuff. He got me in on this thing because they, they said, well, we want to audition somebody to maybe play Kong. And I took my puppet over I had then and said, you, here's how you got to do it. And they said, ah, too much money. Can't do that. Can't, no, no, can't do it. So, okay, so I went over, and I, I took my gorilla suit over, which is good enough, but they said, no, no, we have one you can wear. We've got the Bigfoot suit from Andre the Giant. Now, he's about 18 <laughs> feet taller than me. And uh, I said, well, okay. Uh, I, I put the suit on, and the legs went out about five feet beyond my legs. And the arms, we finally had to fold them all up. I looked like I had Popeye gorilla arms, what it looked like. And so they had to make a new sculpt uh, uh, for me, though. So they used Joe Don Baker's head. Now, Joe Don Baker's head's about twice the size of mine. <laughs> I said, why don't you take a cast of mine? Don't have time. Don't have time. We'll do this. So here comes this big gorilla thing. The mouth's down to here. And they glue it on me, and it doesn't want to hold because it's just too much of it. This makeup guy comes and says, I got something. He's got this big tube, looks like a giant tube of toothpaste. He said, this will hold an elephant to a wall. This will work. And he put that on me, and man, it worked all right. It held on. We tore it off in pieces, and my face looked like hamburger for a couple of weeks after that. But it didn't work at all. I mean, it was just terrible. And so poor Jur Sargent had to do the uh, the direction on it, and he just kind of went, oh, boy, I don't know about this. And, and I got one of the other guys out of, out of uh, he was retirement, to shoot the stuff, and a special effect guy, and he said, why did they come out to do this crap? You know, but anyway, so here they are, and they got a little hut built up and all that, so I'm supposed to walk in there and do that, and they have a little Barbie doll down by a fake beach thing. I'm supposed to come down and lift the doll up and all that <laughs> stuff. I can't even hardly see it through this face, and the hands are so big, I'm just like, <laughs> Whatever it is, you know, I heard it. Oh, it's upside down. Well, anyway, I do. And then they had a plane, an old biplane. A guy had it on a stick. And the first thing I did, it was grab it and wreck it. He didn't have it up high enough. And just pfft, well, took care of that. Well, I won't have the plane. Don't worry about it. So we did that. Now, here's the thing that is the weirdest thing of all. One of the art directors said, you know what? If we make everything smaller, we, it'll be smaller. The scale will be smaller. It won't cost us as much money. Let's use a dwarf as a gorilla. Okay. So what do they do? <laughs> oh, my God. They, they take this little guy who was a great little guy, really a nice fella. They put him in the big foot, big, what am I, big foot son of Bigfoot, which is still three times bigger for him. 
<laughs> used the same head as I had, which means it came down to his stomach, you know. And they said, okay, now here's, here's the kicker. They said, we're going to shoot the same footage with him. So they had him watching. He said, all right, now you're going to come through the back of this thing and, and, you know, come on the beach, pick up the girl. He said, well, here's what we want you to do. Now, we can't see you behind the building. <laughs> it's too small. <laughs> so wiggle the trees and bushes when you come through. No, you're coming out. So he did. Here comes the little guy out. He's stumbling all over the place. He's got the hands that look like, I don't know what they look like. He can't even pick the doll up. It's impossible for him to do it. <laughs> and he's just walking around, and it was just, oh, man, I'm just standing there with the camera guy, and the camera guy said, oh, God, I could have stayed home on the beach. you know. But anyway, I don't know how that ever worked. I never got to see any of the footage. They, they, they burned it all. Oh, man, I, I wish we could eight. see it. It's a oh, long journey too. to end up with Rick Baker. That's true. They wind that's up true. ending up with your old friend in the in the gorilla suit. That's it. Well, well that's the one that ended up that Carlo made or what's his name, Rambaldi. Uh, his name? Dino De Laurentiis. Dino you know, did it. Yeah, he did right. all that stuff. But it was but it was real weird. And and you worked with another guest of ours, uh, Roger Corman. Oh yeah, yeah. Roger was a great guy. He still is a great guy. As a matter of fact, he's yes, going to outlive us all. He's in his nineties. He's got to be nine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he's still just as smart as he ever was. You know, and still has the same money he had originally. <laughs> <laughs> he knew how to spend that stuff, or not to spend it. I yeah. guess. You know? he, he was infamous for that. He was a great guy. He, uh, uh, I, well, I worked with Paul Blazer, my friend Paul Blazer, who did the She Creature, the Conquer sure. the World, Saucer Men, that kind of stuff. Another genius. And that's where I, I first met Roger on Con- Conquer the World, I think, something like that. And, uh, but he was a great guy. I mean, he was, he was really cool. He, uh, he liked Paul's work a whole lot, and that was kind of neat. The only quarrel they ever had is he, they were supposed to stay in a cave the whole film. And it looked great in the cave, but then he wanted it to come out at the end. And it looked like a big, uh, I don't know, upside down turnip or something i don't know what it was everybody laughed in the theater so when paul and we all saw it we got up and left he couldn't he couldn't see it anymore because he knew they were going to get laughs you know later on it became kind of a cult picture though and it's pretty good and it's a, an original design for a monster i'll say that for it but uh, you know uh he liked roger liked paul and paul liked roger a lot i mean they both got along all right except for that one time you know but they, they did a lot of stuff like that. And then AIP ended up screwing him over, of course, like they always do. You know, work for nothing right now, and when we get big, you'll be with us. You know, oh, yeah, I said, boop, see ya. <laughs> you know, he was a great did. talent, Paul, who winds, up, uh, who winds yep. up eventually turning his back on the business. Completely. Yeah. yeah he finally, because he did everything on a handshake. You know, he thought everybody was honest, everybody was good. Well, they weren't. They turned out not that way. And so it finally just got to him where he couldn't take it anymore. You know, they, they finally, he said, I got to ask for some more money for a little bit of stuff. No, no, we pay you the same money. That's always good. That's, yeah. That's it's ridiculous. A great you know? talent. I urge our, our listeners to look yeah. up Paul Blaisdell's oh, work and, 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 do. and his career and the very imaginative yep. guy. Did you meet the other AIP characters? Did you meet Nicholson and Arkoff? James yes. Nicholson? What were, those well, guys, Arkoff, what were those guys Arkoff, like? Arkoff was sort of the ape. Yeah, he was kind of like that. He was the head guy. Right. He was the money man. Jack Nicholson was the sweetest guy I've ever met in my whole life. This guy was so good. He's the one that came up with the titles. Yeah. With all the she ja- James all Jack Nicholson, yeah. That's him. Yeah. And he was a wonderful man. In fact, he gave me, I went down to Film Roll, which is down in Vermont, uh, a 35-millimeter print of Saucer Men. Just gave it to me. So wow! Take this, sign it. It's yours. I have no projector to show it on, but I have a film anyway. But he was—he was a nice, nice human being. That guy. Now, who was the special effects guy, who uh, from the old movies, who built the shark for Jaws? Oh well, that was uh, my friend Chris Mueller built the thing. He's the guy who sculpted it. Yeah, he did a lot of stuff. And then there was—I can't think of the guy that made it work. I just can't think of his oh, name. Oh, I know his name, and I can't think of it either. I, I, yeah, you know, but he, he was the guy that actually figured out how to make it work. And not Carlo like Rambaldi. No, oh, God, no. He no. did not have to tie his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, oh, I set him up. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, but that's just the way it is. There was one guy, he was famous for, like... Our listeners are screaming the name out. To yeah, the, the, like, the, the, like Journey to the Center of the Earth, or... One of those type movies. Trying to think. Uh, we'll figure but, it out. Yeah. Could it be uh, Abbott? I think it's his last name, possibly, or first name. I can't remember. He was a guy who was with Fox for years, and a really good effects guy, too. He was really good. You can look. Why don't you know that now? We should have. That, we, don't, we, don't, we can't don't. afford a researcher, Bob. Ah, yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> and and our, our yeah. fans yeah. are going to be yeah. uh, tweeting us really angrily. I think Abbott sounds right. 
Oh, yeah. it could be. Yeah, not not I, Norman I, Abbott, who directed you in no, Ghostbusters. No, no, no. Yeah, he directed us. Yeah, yeah different no, guy. No, it's just, I can't think of his first name now. But, really, you know. Yeah, Remember, I'm old. Wasn't Bud Abbott. wasn't Bud Abbott yeah. either. Yeah, right. yeah, as, long, as long as we're talking about legends that you met, tell us about uh, the legendary Ed Wood. Oh, Ed. Now, there's a good guy. I mean, well, I say that and a lot of people get all over me about it. But I get on my soap dish with him. Uh, you know, everybody thought he was a crook and got the money. and uh, well, well, he did in a way. But in his early days, before he started drinking and stuff, you know, he uh, every dime he got went into his movies. I mean, literally went into his movies, you know. And he thought he thought he was doing good stuff. And like I always said about him, I said the one thing or two things Ed doesn't have. He's got the drive. He's got the wish for it. It's just taste and talent he doesn't have. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in your book. It's a great line. You say he yeah. had everything it takes to be a great filmmaker. He ex- did. Except he, those two things. He did, you know. Yeah. But he still tried. And he got him done, you know. Well, he, I feel he gave uh, Bela probably another three or four years of his life, for sure. I think Bela would have died a long time ago if, if he hadn't have kind of resurrected him and helped him, you know, and stuff. Uh, it was kind of a, a love relationship there. It was kind of father and son type of thing, you know. But Ed, I always thought Ed was, uh, he was not a bad guy. He was not a, uh, a blowhard guy. He, he just wasn't, you know. He liked to cross-dress, but that's just what he liked to do. There was no big thing about well, it. Well, so does know? Gilbert. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I heard about that. Yeah, <laughs> were you you were on the set of Plan Nine from Outer Space, which wasn't yes, I was. which wasn't called that at the time? How about that? No, was, oh, I, I, was I forget called, what it was. Was called. it something? Gra- I think up, Grave Robbers. Yeah, or yes, something up Grave Robbers ghouls? from Outer Space. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was. Uh, yeah, it had something to do with ghouls too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was down there one day, and uh, that's when the one of the tombstones fell over. And he did say, don't worry about it. Nobody will notice it. You know, yeah. <laughs> he was there. This is, this, and, is and gave, this is movie history. The man was wow. the man was on the set of Plan 9. Yeah, and then they, and poor uh, Tor Johnson had these contacts, and he couldn't see squat. He was falling into everything <laughs> in the world, you know. And uh, But everybody loved John. Everybody loved him, though. I mean, I don't know who didn't. Well, I know a few people that didn't like Ed Wood. They thought he was a whatever. Now, I was called down when they were going to make Ed Wood. And Tim Burton was going to direct it, and they knew I knew Ed, so they wanted to know if I could say something. I went down, and I swear to God, when I walked in, uh, what's his name? Johnny Depp was doing a scene, and I thought I saw Edward's ghost. Wow. That's how close he was. I mean, I really thought I saw his ghost. And so I told Tim, I said, I can't tell you anything about this guy. I mean, he's he's got it down, you know, and all this stuff. And he even came over and talked to me for a while, uh, and he— I just said, man, you've got it. You got to nail. There's nothing I can tell you, you know. But I, when people say he was a bad guy and all that kind of stuff, maybe later on when he started drinking, it probably did go right into his drink. I'm sure. I mean, the last time I ever saw the man was about six months before he died. He came by CBS where I worked, and the guard called me down and says, "You want to come and see this guy?" He said, "I think he's drunk, but come on down and see him." So I went down, and he was, you know. And he looked all scabby. It just didn't look very good at all. And so I took him in the coffee room where we were, and I got him some coffee, and we talked. And he said, well, Bob, I'm going to do another film, and I really need help. I need some money. Well, I had $50 on me that day, and I just gave it to him. I did. I just said, okay. And I knew it was going to go into a bottle. I knew it did. But I had that much respect for the guy because he, he was really basically a good guy. He was not, he's not a crook. He was not a – well, they say all kinds of bad things about him. I don't believe it. He never treated me that way ever, you know. And uh, so I get on my soapbox sometimes about that when people get on me. Uh, there was one book thing, a guy was doing the, the worst pictures in the world and blah, 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 and and he wanted me to say bad things about it. And I said, no, I won't say that. You're not. Because they weren't the worst movies in the world. Boy, there's been a lot more. Like there's the creeping. Uh, oh, the creeping <laughs> terror. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, the, which is, which the, is the, with the, the carpet yes. that wraps yeah. around. Yeah. yeah, you know. That's now, worse. That's a bad movie. <laughs> Yep. Now I think Plan Nine looks pretty good next to that. You that's, know, it's a nice story that you gave him the f- your last fifty bucks. I think because you shared his love for films, you wanted to see him succeed. Yep, absolutely. Not only because you mean, liked that, him personally. Yeah, I, I was just hoping he'd be able to do something with it, but he didn't. You know, I thought he was probably too far gone by then anyway. But but he was a decent fella. I mean, that's all there was to it. I uh, I guess maybe I like the guys that have it rough sometimes. You yeah. know, I mean, because I I being a no talent myself, I just got by by. Getting by, and I don't even know how. I I don't know. Maybe it's because I broke their windows and stuff. I, it's something like that. I you sit they next to I, Tor Johnson I, I, at the screening? Yes, we did, and that was so <laughs> funny. This is like a Drew wow. Friedman cartoon come to life. Wow. <laughs> we were sitting there. We saw Edward. It was down at a uh, real sleazy theater in L.A. It was not the Pantages that they used in the movie, sure. of course. 
And we sat with him and his wife and his son, I guess it was. And they were all the same size. That was kind of weird. They were real big. I mean, you know. And big once in a while, you'd see him on the screen, and he would go, oh, that's okay. Yeah, that looked good. You know, you'd hear him make these little comments and stuff, you know. Very nice <laughs> fella. Extremely nice guy, you know. And it was raining. That's true. That really was, you know. Kathy had never seen anything like this stuff. I haven't really indoctrinated her yet to that type of the world, you know. So she didn't know exactly what to say, you know. And uh, some guys got up there in the stage and said, oh, 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 and the, 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 uh, the guy was a chiropractor, whoever it was that played Bela after he died. Oh, he got yeah. Up and gave was it Tom Mason? About, yes. He, he got up and said, oh, I'm so, I'm so honored that, that you know, I, I got to do Bela. He's so wonderful, and I really love doing it. And, and, it, and they finally had to cut him off. He was going to go forever. He just wanted to talk about everything, I guess. I don't know. But it was neat. It was really neat. Uh, did you talk to Lugosi at all? <laughs> yes, not there, not at the film. I talked to him when he got out of rehab. He kicked the dope habit thing. And we used to have a show at KNXT, CBS, that was uh, giving uh, trophies to guys that went through hardships and made it. Well, he made it so they had it. So I went down. I knew the makeup guy. And so I, when he was coming in for makeup, I went and sat in with him for a while. And uh, he was so thrilled that he was off of this stuff. I mean, that he did well and stuff, you know. And uh, he was a very nice man. I mean, he was very articulate. Uh, his mind seemed to be settled again. He was pretty good. And he just kept saying, I'm so glad I kicked it. I'm so glad I kicked it, you know. And I said, well, you got thousands and millions of fans out there that are glad for you too, you know. And uh, he was very nice. Really a swell, very nice fellow. This is a man who met... Dracula, <laughs> Frankenstein, <laughs> and the Wolfman, and the Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I told my wife earlier this is probably the last broadcast I'll ever do because I'll go home tonight and probably have a coronary. No, no, no! Don't don't say, don't <laughs> don't say that, Bob. Like that, you know? <laughs> but, but at least I, I'll, I'll die of something I really love doing, though. I mean, that's the whole thing, you know. I mean, the only other thing I'd rather be in as well is wearing the gorilla suit right now, and I, I'd like it better. But that's <laughs> it. how did you how did you settle on the name Kogar for your gorilla? Uh, it was a guttural sound. I okay. just kept going, arr, arr, like, and I thought, Kogar. Now, that sounds like a mean name. I mean, like a, an animal, something would do it, I guess, you know. And then, of course, Tracy was for the Ghostbusters. He had to be a, you know, likable ape or whatever. And then when Rick made that head for me, boy, he just, he captured this great thing I wanted in the ape thing. Kogar couldn't have done it. That, that face wouldn't have done it. And you, one time on Ghostbusters, you, you were dressed as the gorilla, Mm -hmm. And you were going down a hill. In a oh car. yes, <laughs> uh, with Larry, with Storch. Yeah, yeah. Well, that uh, yeah, it's still in the opening of the show. You see us coming down in the, in the hill. That was a fire break, and so Norman said, "Can you guys go up there to the fire break?" And I said, "I don't know if this old car can make it, man. I mean, it was really an old. It was nineteen thirty something. Whip it, I think. Whip it was the name of the car." Thank you, Kat. See, she's good for me. Kathy, she thinks is, stuff I can't Kathy is sitting right there with Bob well, filling in the blanks. Well, she gave me a whole thing on the way over here. She talked about everything she could think of, except that one time where I got the pictures in the post office, but that was different. Anyway. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about that. But it had something to do with a mule. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so we, we got up there, and I'm looking up. Boy, that's pretty far down, you know. And that, now, Tuck wasn't with us that day. He, he was off somewhere but he didn't supposed to be he, we were going after the ghost assignment which he didn't go with us anyway so we went down and we start going down a hill and he said no and he also Norman said, when you get down here can you do do like a a, a, a fish thing i mean f you know flail the car around by the camera so it looks like it's going this way and i said well, i'm not a stunt guy i said well can i just wear gloves the rubber hands are hard to work and the feet are hard to work can i work and he said no you got to wear the whole thing i might want you getting out i said okay but i can barely even hold on to the wheel with these hands you know so anyway, I went up there, and he said, he wants me to fishtail out of this, Larry. And I said, so I want to tell you something. If I yell jump, jump, because, I mean, I'll make it. If I go over the hill, over the cliff right where they are, I'll make it probably in the gorilla suit. I don't know if you would or not because he had a plastic <laughs> hip just put in. He said, okay, I'll try my best. So anyway, we get up there, and I hear he's got a mega. Okay, action, come on down. I'm coming down and just hitting the stuff in there, the trees and bushes and stuff. The car is just going everywhere. And so I start trying to brake, and the brake goes right to the floor. There is no brake in that car. Wow. It's gaining more speed, and I, I'm telling Larry, get ready, Larry. I have no brakes. I tried to pull the emergency brake, nothing. I said, oh, boy. So I'm coming down. 
And Larry's yelling at him, and I'm, get out of the way, get out of the way. So we come on down, and I, I did do a sort of a fishtail. I mean, just to save my life is what we were doing. <laughs> Went on down the street, and they had the street, uh, Mulholland, uh, you know, blocked off with sure. some couple of cops. And I couldn't get the thing stopped. It was kind of going downhill. And I said, what am I going to do? And the cops down there waving at us, and he's going, get out of the way, get out of the way. And they finally see us, and they, they suddenly tear off on their sickles. I go right through them. I keep going. I finally had to put it in a ditch to make it stop. So I finally got it stopped, and we got back down there, and, and so Norm looks, he says, can you do it one more time? Wow. <laughs> I'm trying to picture Larry Storch in a zoot suit, <laughs> yes. Bob Burns in a gorilla suit, driving a car with no brakes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah, you love it, show it, business, it, Bob? I do. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I never thought I'd be doing that part, you know, but it was fun. But then when Tucker came in the next day, he was mad. I mean, he told, and so he came out to Norm, had a little talk with him, like, if you ever try to send these guys in out this car again without me checking it first. And uh, I, I said, but well, I don't think I'm going out in the car again. I'll do the dry stuff on the stage, you know, and that stuff. But I don't think we never had to go. We shot all those things out there. Now, that was shot in, in a place called uh, Piru, Lake Piru or something. And they have a place there. It's an alcoholic rehab. <laughs> And there's a lot of guys walking around going into the <laughs> saloons down there. They would see this ape walking around. And they went in. I think they were getting the DTs or something. Yeah, they, they went in the saloon pretty fast at that time. So when we drove up, I had to drive this thing. We're driving all up and everything. Sometimes they'd just come walking into the scene. Hey, man, what are you doing? Yeah, this kind of thing. Cut, 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 that kind of thing. But it got to be funny after a while. It was kind of fun. By the way, guest stars on the uh, the Ghostbusters, the only Ghostbusters <laughs> Gilbert cares about, by the way, Yeah, uh, yes. include our friend Bernie Co- Opel, who's done this show, Jim, oh, yeah. Jim Backus, Hunts Hall, you'll wow. love this skill, Billy, Billy Barty, yep. the great Howard Morris, yeah. and, oh, my and, God, yes. and burying the lead, jo- Joey Ross. Wow. Yep. <laughs> you yeah. well, you with- know, you know uh, uh, Howie Morris was going to supposedly direct our show originally. Right. But but he uh, he got some commercials he had to do and stuff, so he didn't. So Norm came in, you know. But uh, all those guys were great, man. They were such terrific guys. I... Uh, I never worked with anybody, never met those kind of guys before, you know. And now, Hunts, we did two shows with him. He was just so damn funny. He was so great. And we got to improvise a lot, Hunts and I did. We did just all kinds of stuff ourselves, you know. And and that's the great thing, shooting it on tape, you could get away with anything you wanted. I mean, uh, Mark, the, the, uh, I mean, the writer of the show, he said, do anything you feel. If you feel like you can do funnier stuff than what's written, do it. And we did that quite a few times. And it was really, really cool. And, did, did Tucker uh, break into the Music Man uh, spontaneously? Yes, he sometime? did. On yep. set, we were, we were setting up stuff. Yeah, he did it back in Chicago for a while. Yeah, and he was a hoofer, a real hoofer. Sure, too. I didn't even know that. You know, he comes down and he starts doing the uh, oh, what's that big oh, tune? Trouble in, in Rubber City. In River City. City. Yeah, he did this whole thing, man, and he had us all. Just, we were just just glowing at him. We couldn't even move. It was so great. He did the whole number, the whole thing, you know, and then they got a big round of applause for him and all that stuff. And he says, boy, I miss doing that stuff. I really miss doing it. You know, he worked at the Jury Lane Theater back in Chicago. That's where he loved to work. And uh, he was good, man. We did one thing where we had to dance. Now, Larry didn't dance. The gorilla never dances. I mean, <laughs> never. That's you got that deal with the gorilla never dances. <laughs> yeah. So they said, well, you got to dance. You got to be with Tuck. You got to do this two step thing, whatever it is, you know. And Larry was as bad as I was, you know. So they brought a tutor in for us. And the tutor finally walked up and says, I can't teach these guys anything. I mean, they're not going to learn. And Tuck said, oh, they will. I'll whip them into place, you know. Anyway, we, we did it. And it came off well. I, I was surprised, really. But it was, uh, oh, but we were just, we, we didn't know what we were doing, you know. Now- it, was, it was just. Did yes. Far did Forrest Tucker and Larry Storch were they friends in real life? Oh yes, I believe oh, yes. so. Yeah, yeah. yeah even before end. even before F Troop, I mean they were friends, and then F Troop they really became solid, and that was it. That's why they loved to do this show because they were working together again. It's what they wanted to do, you know. And I was the new kid on the block, and I was I was scared of these. Oh, I was scared of these guys. I was because I was you know here again. They're an icon. It's like you. I'm still a little scared of you right now. <laughs> I'm getting better, but I'm a little scared. I'm scared you're going to come out with that whammy, you know, and it's going to come and knock me right off the microphone. You know. But uh, anyway, so the first day we were shooting, I held back. I, I did a thing, and then I looked at Tuck, and I thought he was giving me kind of a bad look. It was just I didn't know him then at all. So I didn't know what to do. So the next thing, uh, Norm comes and says, Bob, 
what are you doing? You're doing shtick and stuff. And all of a sudden, you're kind of stopping behind me. You've got to do this. And I said, okay. So I said, but i got to talk to these guys because I was really worried. And I went over there sitting in their chairs. And I said, guys, can I just talk to you for a minute? And I said, i got a problem. Now, Tuck, who I didn't know yet, didn't know his sense of humor, goes, what the hell could possibly be your problem? This is the first show. You know, and I said, well, I think I'm upstaging you guys, and I don't mean to do that. I, a new kid on the block or an animal, they can't, and I don't mean to do that. That's not what I'm trying to do. So if you find me doing that, let me know. You know, Tuck says, is that your problem? And I said, uh, yeah. You know, and he goes, well, all right. Look, I'm too old for ego crap. I'm way too old for that. And he said, Larry's too out of it. He doesn't even know what's going on around him. <laughs> <laughs> I believe and, Larry's and Larry too was, stupid was the, was and Larry, the, yeah, and Larry was the line. Went, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and Larry went, yep, yep, that's right, yep. He said, if you can stand behind me and go bloop and get a laugh, he said, you're here to make people laugh. He said, we're going to be second bananas to you anyway. We know that already, and we're fine with it. But he said, do anything you want to do, you know. And boy, from then, I never had a problem. That's nice. Generous around. performers. Oh, I just thought of, of I just thought of the, uh, the, make, the effects wizard's name. I think it's L.B. Abbott. That's it. L.B. Just, Abbott. You just popped it. into that's my head. It. Man, he's pretty good, Gilbert. You know that? <laughs> yeah, he, he keeps me around grudgingly. Oh, I, I, yeah. Okay, I got Make a big finish good. for you, Gil. Oh. Yes. Now, that, oh. I, don't, I don't know if you found this in your research. Uh, speaking of legendary showmen, uh, Bob yes. also got to spend some time with someone who's come up on this show, William Castle. Yes. Wow. Yeah, that was and, a great experience. And what did you do with William Castle? Because Gil's going uh, Gil, to jump out of his chair now. Yeah, well, uh, I was in the Army at that time down in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and they were bringing in the Tingler. And so I was doing uh, uh, the local uh, shock theater down there because I couldn't stand the Army. It was driving me crazy. So Kathy and I went down and got a job doing stuff, different monsters for him and things. And so they were bringing the Tingler in. So he came in, and uh, I, I did a thing with him. What I can't even remember what it was now. And I said, boy, I'd like to come down and watch you guys when you hook up these chairs and stuff you're going to be doing out here. And he goes, okay, come on down. So I went down, and I helped him. They, they were – what they were were like uh, plain de-icer things. They were little off, offset cams that would shake the wings and knock the snow off of them. You know, that's what they actually were because it would shake the seat. No, no electricity. God, somebody died, you know. But so they did that, and it was great. I, I loved it, you know. And uh, so we got to wire up some of the seats and stuff. And then after we got done, he said, I want to get pictured because I, I made up as the wolf man. I had her as Miss Shock, a thing with an eye hanging down here somewhere. That's how she looked when I first met her. So <laughs> that, uh, it worked out pretty good that way. And uh, so then um, he said, I want to get pictures of all you guys. So we went to his hotel. So they shot a bunch of pictures of me and off both of us all giving him. Oh, and I'd made up a, a uh, key to the city out of skeleton bones. Real skeleton bones, because that's one of my jobs in the Army was repairing the skeletons that these guys would always take and put in the guys' beds and scare them to death, you know. Wow. So I found some bones, and I made a big hip bone for the main thing. Well, anyway, I made this thing up, and I uh, wanted to have Kathy to present it to him. So he loved it. He, in fact, his, his daughter still has it today. She kept it. I got to talk to her a while back. She still has it. That's, that's kind of neat. Yeah, we want to talk to her, to his daughter. Oh, she's Get sweet. her on the she, show. So, she is so sweet. So here you go, Gil. This man actually wired seats for the Tingler. Yes, and I did. That, <laughs> that, of course, is that famous part of the movie where the where Vincent Price goes, scream, scream <laughs> for your lives. The Tingler is loose in the theater. <laughs> Pretty God, good, that's huh, a Bob? great impression, man. That's really good. <laughs> I like you even more now. That's your, I didn't know you did voices for coming out loud. <laughs> oh, he does I a thought, few. I thought his was hard enough to do, but geez, I mean, that's amazing, man. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm proud of that. You know? But anyway, yeah, I did. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. And then what he did is he took us back to this hotel and we ate, so whatever we wanted to do, you know. And then I asked him if he could send me a couple of pictures. He sent me a whole packet of the pictures when he got back. I actually sent them to me in the Army. And that was, he was the sweetest man. Boy, was he a great guy and a great showman. Oh, we're fans. Such, we're fans. Yeah, We've talked about him on this show. show. Did you get and, a chance uh, to meet Vincent Price? Yes, I did. I got to meet him over at TV City one day. I went over and he was doing a... I forget, some comedy show with somebody over there. Because I, I, I worked at KNXT, but I also would go over to TV City if I wanted to. So I went over there and saw him, met him. And he was, here again, another completely sweet man. I mean, the guy was just, you felt like you knew him for years when you first talked to him. He would treat you like he's known you forever. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's, it's quite a journey 
Bob, yep. you know, and this, I want to plug your books in a second here, but oh. you're, a, you're a man after our own hearts, right, Gil? Oh, a, a, my God, a, a, yes. A, a man who just like, gave his life to, to, to the movies, just loves, <laughs> he just, and, he just loves. And you're one of those people, like, if, if people in the audience don't know mm-hmm. who you are, it's like, I, I, we just want to tell them, if you're a true Horror and sci-fi fan. Everybody knows Bob Burns. Absolutely. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to get you on the show for months, Bob. It was a real, it was a real chase. I know. And I went to the hospital a couple of times. I did all kinds of things. I to know. We of appreciate it. that. You're you and you're and you're a trooper, and here you are finally. So yes, we, and I'm thrilled to death. I can't tell you how thrilled I am. You're a, a kid that grew up in Oakland. You're a, you're an Okie from Muskogee. Oh I certainly God. am. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yep. Yes, I'm proud of it too. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I urge our listeners to get the books. Uh, I'm going to talk about them. It came from Bob's basement, which is terrific. Mm-hmm. Exploring the science fiction and monster movie archive of Bob Burns, which is filled with wonderful pictures of your collection and other stuff. And this book, which I'm going to give to Gilbert because I, I read it and I absolutely loved it. Bob Burns' Monster Kid Memories. Oh, First hand yeah. encounters with makers of the classic monster movies, and it's kind of a it's kind of a a memoir. That's what it is. It's my favorite book. It, it's one that I said it was my love letter to all these guys I knew, all these people, you know, that I don't think got a chance to get known that well. I mean, they knew or known that well, but I mean, know the inside of how they worked and how they were. It's just, right. Yeah, I'm just so thrilled about this, guys. I can't even tell you how thrilled. Well, we're thrilled. I mean, we we do this show because of our love for this stuff and 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 our and our shared love for for uh, for these people and these talents and. Uh, Two of the other things, too, that emerge from the books is, uh, you know, your relationship with your grandfather who got you into this in the first place oh, by buying you those yep. Superman figures back in the he day. He was the guy. Yep. We went down. There's these figures down there at an auto light place or something. It's just in Oklahoma yet. And I saw him and I saw each one of them. There was two of them had different S's on their chest. One was evidently one done later. And I couldn't figure out which one. So he bought them both for me. That's the kind of guy he was. And yeah, that's nice. And you sent away for the box top. You got the box tops and the cereal, and you're one of those I kids that all. used to get the, the Dakota yeah. ring and the badge I, and all of that stuff yeah. in the books. And that, that was hard because I, the cereal I didn't like, so I'd pour it in the trash. <laughs> but my mom thought I liked it. You know, I'd say, well, I finished this box up pretty fast. You know? <laughs> so it worked out all right. But no, I, well, I've, I've always been a, a, well, I love radio for one thing. Yeah. And I just love the idea of, of these. Premiums. I never got one I didn't like. A lot of guys got them in these little boxes. Ah, it's a piece of crap. None of them are a piece of crap to me. They're all treasures, every one. I love them. Because, see, I live, I don't know where I live. Am I in the past? I don't know where I am. I just, I don't, you know, well, I don't you're, know. You're one of us. Your collection. Is that what it is? Your collection of all the monster and sci-fi. Yeah. It's, it's like some people look upon that as like really kitsch camp kind of stuff and you oh, i get a lot of that yeah yeah but you actually have a love for each and every one of those oh, things absolutely it all means something to me i've had some people come in very few somebody brings somebody and guy says if you got rid of all this crap you'd have a really big room and i said oh, yeah God. i would wouldn't i <laughs> didn't, didn't you add an extension to the house to to, to yes to, to, oh yeah we had to to fit it all yeah. Yeah. Are you, uh, you ever out this way? We'll you come ever out. Get out. Well, I used to live out there, but I didn't know you then, unfortunately. Well, but we'll come out. Well, we'll make a pilgrimage. Please do, because I'd, li- I'd love to show you the place before I can't remember what there is in there. <laughs> yeah. we've, been in, we've been invited to Tippy Hedren's uh, Cat Preserve, oh. and now we've been invited to Bob Burns' uh, yeah, basement. I, I'm to not the music. going to Tippy yeah. Hedren's Cat Preserve. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well, this stuff won't bite you either. That's the difference. Yeah. And the other thing that emerges from the books and from your story is your, your relationship uh, with Kathy. And I was saying before we turned the mics on, you are, you are lo- a lucky man to have met somebody oh. who shares your passions. The luckiest, and, and was your yeah. and was your uh, your aide de camp for all of this and all of these years, yeah. and you guys put on these wonderful lavish Halloween presentations for years yeah. in your house, and would you have four thousand people at the house oh, at one yeah, at we, one we year? Had quite a few people come to these things. Yeah, they did. Oh, by the way, uh, I just wanted to let you know that I'm sending you a, a copy of the Halloween shows. Oh, I finally got him. I wonderful. Got him. Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. him that, and he said he finally yeah. put them on DVD. Finally put wow. them on DVD. How, how many years did you do them, Bob? Uh, from 1962 on, I guess, pretty Amazing. much. And we missed a couple of years, but most of the time. But see, I had some of the greatest friends in the world. There's special effects people, makeup people, God only knows what they are, you know, writers, everything. And they all helped with these things, and they, they made it what it was. I, I used to just say they used my yard. I just let them use my yard for stuff. Oh, no, they're they were, elaborate. 
Oh, very much so. It's much more than I ever thought it would be. We never counted on that stuff. But you get those kind of talent, boy, it's really something, you know. But I, uh, oh, I think they're wonderful. I mean, Kathy and I have had a, a pretty great life together doing crazy things. Now, she's <laughs> a lot – she's not nuts like I am. Like, she go, <laughs> likes to go off and shoot beautiful pictures and right. animals and almost get eaten up by animals. She, she loves that kind of stuff. See? But I, I, I see the pictures, so I don't have to go. Well, we have so to thank great. Kathy for facilitating all this all these years. Believe me. She she has, and it hadn't been for her, I'd have been well. I'd, yeah, I'd have been in jail probably. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Most true likely. of both of us. Uh, or I would have been probably in a cave somewhere. And it's like one of these guys they find much later in life is a dead man laying in this cave, and they try to figure out what he was. <laughs> you know. But no, she's been my salvation. She's the one that's kept me around here. It's a great love story, too. I mean, not only the story of a kid from Oklahoma who doesn't know, who grows up you know, obsessed with these things and these toys and these movies, and he doesn't know how he's going to meet any of these people. You move yep. to Burbank, and suddenly all of your your life changes. All these people come into your life. And then, of course, you that meet the it. right woman Yep, who, to go it's on that a- journey with. So it's really a, it's really a lovely story. So yep. we thank you, Bob. And, and, get, the, and get the books, Monster Kid Memories. And it came from Bob's basement. And I'm going to give him to Gil. And and uh, I'm Gilbert Gottfried. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. And we have been talking to Bob Burns, who is a master horror and sci-fi collector. He's an actor. He's a makeup man. Yes. And he's but- a he's a historian. Yes. He's a gorilla suit builder. <laughs> and more importantly... <laughs> and more, he's a showman. And more important than anything else, he almost saw Forrest Tucker's penis. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have regrets in your life. It's, That's one, yes. You've had wonderful things happen... And something tragic like that. (laughs) I'll take that to my grave. (laughs) Okay. Bob, this was great. Thank you. Thank you, Bob Burns. Thank you, guys. We're the Ghostbusters. I'm Spencer. He's Tracy. I'm Kong. We're the Ghostbusters. We're clever, courageous, and strong. Your sleep has been haunted with whispers and rattlings. Your blood has been curdled. We know what to do. Your skin has the creepies. I wonder what's happening. You're safe in our hands. We will take care of you. For the Ghostbusters, spirits and demons, beware. The Ghostbusters, wherever you're hiding out there. We know what you're up to. We're ready for anything. We're bold and we're fearless and never...